describe the medications and mechanisms of action that are used in treating pain. and understand the advantages and disadvantages to clinical care of considering pain as a fifth vital sign. Hi, my name is Dr. Garaj Balmerzai, and today we're going to be touching on two major topics. The first is going to be pain, and then we're going to be spending some time talking about opioids. This is kind of a brief overview of what we're going to go over. We're going to focus in on the types of pain states. This is really important because when you're thinking about what medication should I prescribe, when is it appropriate, understanding pain states and what they are is very important and integral to what you're going to prescribe and what you're going to do for the patient. And then we're going to look at what are opioids. Everybody talks about them. They're on the news constantly, the harms that they cause. But how do they work? What are they? What are their side effects? And we're going to spend some time looking at that. So before we do that, we really have to sit down and define what pain is. The IASP really looks at pain from two angles. They describe it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. It's associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of that damage. So when you get hurt, whether it be by accident, on purpose, such as surgery, there is an unpleasant response that occurs with that. And that experience tied up with the actual tissue damage is what really defines pain. Both of those factors. The sensory experience and the emotional unpleasantness associated are important when we discuss pain. So pain is really divided into two subgroups, two major subgroups. Acute pain, that's pain that just occurred and lasts usually less than three months. We most often associate acute pain with surgical pain or when you fall and hit yourself. Chronic pain is a little bit different. Chronic pain lasts usually greater than three months or beyond what is typically considered tissue repair. We're all familiar with pain. All these pictures of somebody holding their neck, somebody getting hit, and certainly at the abdominal pain which we all have probably experienced. All these people on these pictures are experiencing some form of pain. We're gonna come back and keep referencing this slide. This slide is important because it sits down and really defines all the four different types of pain states which we're gonna be talking about today. Every time we talk about one, I'll come back and reference this slide and really look at which one we're talking about. So let's dive in. So nociceptive pain is really the first kind of pain followed by neuropathic pain, inflammatory and non-inflammatory, non-neuropathic. Just as the previous slide, we're going to be talking about these four pain states in the slides to come. What is nociceptive pain? This is the normal response to noxious insult or injury of tissue. What's noxious? Noxious is any unpleasant stimulus. This is to tissue such as skin, when you cut yourself, muscles, the muscle soreness that you feel maybe after an exercise or getting hit in one of the muscles, and then, of course, the unfortunate fracture of bone, whether it be through an operation or through an accident. This type of nociceptive pain can be further subdivided into two groups, somatic pain and visceral. 
So let's kind of focus in on what we're talking about, which is the top group right now. So you have a noxious stimulus, and as the slide up there says, noxious peripheral stimulus that's coming in. And we subdivided them into two groups, the somatic and the visceral. So the first state under the nociceptive is caused by activation of pain receptors in either body surface or the musculoskeletal tissue. This is things such as, for example, again, when you get your body cut by surgery or by accident, when, for example, you have any kind of dental procedure, you know, root canal or molar removal, as well as any kind of bony structure uh, abnormality, such as when you fracture a bone, your ankle, etc. It's often well localized. So usually if somebody, for example, has their tooth pulled or any kind of root canal, they can tell you exactly where the pain is. Another example would be if somebody, for example, breaks their finger, they can tell you exactly where the pain is. Usually this is described as dull, achy, or sharp. They can tell you right where it's at, and usually they point right at it, and usually they mention those couple of terms. Of course, people can describe pain however, but these are some of the common ones. Visceral pain is the next kind of pain. Pain to secondary or injury of hollow organs. So this is really a pain that is quite vague. Pain that they can't really describe. And if you think about it, it's that deep, that pressure, that squeezing. I see that a lot when I look at patients after, for example, an operation in their abdomen. When they've had, for example, a bowel surgery. Patients usually after that kind of surgery describe the pain as vague all over. Sometimes when you may have experienced it would be if you have a little bit of gas and you have a lot of that distension, that pressure is diffuse and that is visceral pain. Going back to this chart again, the next uh, pain that we're going to be talking about is neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is pain that is caused by primary lesion or disease or of the somatosensory nervous system. So this is pain that can really occur after there's an injury to the brain, pain that can occur after there's injury to, for example, the spinal cord or any of the peripheral nerves. This pain can range in how it's described. It can sometimes be described as tingling. It can be described as burning. It can be described as electrical. Sometimes there's hypersensitivity associated with it or any of those paresthesias, which are the tingling and the burning that can be associated with it. We are very common examples are diabetic peripheral neuropathy on the slide DPN. This is a diabetic who's had long-standing diabetes and comes in to see you or you see them and complains of burning and pain in their hands or in their feet. The other person is the person that comes in with post-herpetic neuralgia. Post-herpetic neuralgia is that shingles outbreak. The person comes in with pain and burning on the side of their chest or their face. Spinal cord injury is another one. That's the SCI. And then a herniated disc. And this slide mentioned is herniated nucleus pulposus, HNP. This is the person that comes in to see you in clinic or you see that complains of back pain with shooting pain down their leg because they have compression from a disc that's pushing on a nerve. Again, here in this slide is described as that letter C where you have the little lightning bolt basically causing damage to a peripheral nerve and then and or causing uh, damage to the spinal cord. The little lightning bolt is sitting on what is the figure it described description of the spinal cord. The next pain state we're going to talk about is letter B, the inflammatory pain state, where inflammatory markers come in and irritate those nerves. So this is activation of and sensitization of these nociceptive pathways by inflammatory mediators that cause tissue inflammation. The examples I included in the slide are just two of many inflammatory states or inflammatory cytokines that can be involved with this inflammatory process. It's interesting because we don't really think of it, but we encounter people every day that have this inflammatory pain state. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, 
scleroderma, lupus. All these patients could have tissue pain secondary to these inflammatory mediators activating these nerves. The last pain state we're going to touch on is the one that we most poorly understand. We really don't know what causes it. It's that non-inflammatory, non-neuropathic kind of pain. And it's the one we're trying to investigate the most because it afflicts a lot more patients than we think. There is no definitive known tissue injury or nerve injury, yet patients have pain. So this pain state is really unknown. It's thought to be due to an aberrancy common example is fibromyalgia. It's a situation where a patient has real definitive pain. It's usually widespread. There is no known cause. There is no visible tissue injury. And all the current tests and studies we have are not able to identify a cause. And these are the pain states that we are currently working on the most because we are starting to realize that a lot of patients potentially have it. Now that we've taken a deeper look into these pain states, let's take a look at opioids, what they do. So they are the most commonly routinely prescribed medication for pain along with NSAIDs, which are your ibuprofen, your Aleve, and acetaminophen, your over-the-counter Tylenol. The most common opioid that people across the globe know is morphine. And I like to call morphine kind of like the granddaddy of all the opioids because everybody knows about it and we compare all other opioids to it in terms of its potency. One thing to know is that all opioids work on this fancy receptor, the mu receptor, and cause pain relief along with many other effects which we'll talk about in just a second. So how do they work? So all opioids work by activating opioid receptors. And when they activate these receptors, they cause hyperpolarization of those nerve signals. This hyperpolarization of those nerve impulses make it possible for these signals to decrease in frequency. And we experience that as what? Pain relief. A lot of fancy terms on this next bullet point, but basically... It's just a net inhibition. So you have a decreasing adenyl cyclase, inhibit voltage-gated calcium channels, and activate inward potassium channels. The net effect of all this is inhibition. Opioids inhibit throughout the central nervous system. And that is where the opioids exert their main effects, by net inhibiting in the central nervous system. As I mentioned, their greatest effect is in the CNS, the central nervous system. This opioid receptor activation inhibits presynaptic release and postsynaptic release of excitatory neurotransmitters, two of which I put on the slide. And those are neurotransmitters that attach to nociceptive neurons that cause excitation and therefore pain impulses being transmitted. I thought I'd put a couple of opioids, uh, the most common ones, so that you can kind of see them. You know, you have morphine at the top, hydrocodone, Norco is very commonly prescribed, oxycodone, Percocet. You have Dilaudid, which again, very commonly used, tramadol, methadone. More of us have started hearing about buprenorphine and fentanyl, which has commonly been in the news because of all the tragedies we've seen across the country. One can't talk about opioids without talking about all the side effects. And I thought I'd separate them out into organ systems because it's not just the big respiratory depression that causes the majority of mortality that's important. It is important to know that opioids affect multiple organ systems. In the central nervous system, not only do they cause pain relief, which we've talked about, and why they're being prescribed by physicians and nurses, but they also cause sedation, dizziness, euphoria. They can cause hallucinations. They can cause confusion. And in terms of the eyes, they can cause blurred vision. From a cardiovascular standpoint, although not often discussed, they can drop your blood pressure. 
that can cause bradycardia. Most of us are familiar with a constipation with opioids. And this constipation does not get better with time. Patients complain about it throughout. Nausea is also common. Urinary retention is rarely discussed but can happen. And of course, under the other category, the dependence that can occur, which is the root cause of our current epidemic. So what are the uses for the opioids? They're most effective when given after surgery or trauma for a very short period of time, usually less than seven days. Most data points to very little need for use of opioids after the acute pain has subsided. And usually that occurs in less than seven days. It is important to know that when combining opioids, if they are needed, using acetaminophen and NSAIDs, which I talked about earlier, improves sometimes their uh, pain benefiting profile. However, again, there's more and more data pointing to the use of both those without the need for opioids for a lot of the common operations that we currently perform. There are other medications that we use for pain. Certainly opioids are most commonly used in the acute setting, but there are other medications uh, that are more effective than opioids in the long-term setting. And some of those medications will be discussed in other lectures in this course. So to summarize, there are four major pain states, and there certainly can be overlap. I don't want you guys walking away from these slides thinking that somebody can only be in one category. Somebody certainly can have somatic pain with neuropathic features. The other point is that opioids are most effective if used for acute pain in the short term. Recognizing that NSAIDs and acetaminophen are usually plenty and enough for most operations. Other medications do exist for acute pain and they should be looked at and used. And there are more effective medications for chronic pain certainly than opioids. And those will be discussed